Hey everybody, it's Dr. Bill Jensen again, and welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Wellness Experience. Today we're going to be talking everything sleep. So every night when you come home to bed and you jump in for your nightly slumber, does your dreams and your thoughts that you're going to bed with sound a little bit like this? Or when you come home and you crawl into bed and you're trying to get to sleep as fast as possible because you got deadlines the next day and you got a lot of stuff you want to be productive with, does it sound more like this? Well, if it is the second one, you're not alone. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this podcast is all about sleep because it's so vitally important to our productivity and to our health and longevity long term. And this podcast isn't just for you. It, a lot of this stuff is for me. Uh, these are one of the things as I kind of got into health, longevity, wellness, and I started tracking my metrics like we'll sp speak about today. Um, I found out glaringly obvious that I struggle with sleep. And it's not a matter of getting to sleep. It's a matter of staying asleep. Uh, so we're going to talk all about that stuff, um, how many hours we need to be sleeping a night, the type of sleep we're looking to get. Uh, all the things about sleep science, and then we're going to dive deep into some things that you can be doing in order to get a better night's sleep, live a longer, more productive, more energetic life. Um, and that's basically why the foundation of today's episode is all about sleep. So let's talk about where we're at in America. Um, currently, about 70 million Americans suffer with sleep issues. So if you take a look at the population uh, as a whole, about 350 some million people compared to 70, that's about 20% of the population are struggling with sleep. And it's crazy because like, when you think about sleep, it's probably one of the most natural things that you would think about being able to do and do easy, right? I mean, you have a full day, you get home at the end of the day, you're tired and you should just be able to fall asleep, sleep through the night, wake up rested and then go about your business the, the rest of the day. Um, but people struggle. And of those 20 million people, I found out through research that about 9 million people have to take drugs and sleep aids in order just to even fall asleep and stay asleep uh, throughout the night. And that's pretty crazy. So when you're having sleep deprivation uh, chronically, uh, there's a lot of different health issues that can uh, come up as a result of it. And so if you're a person like me and you think that you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep at night, but you're really getting closer to like five and four and a half or four in some nights because you wake up so many times being restless during the night. Um, these things can happen. Depression. It's a huge issue in the United States right now. Uh, in fact, uh, depression is up 30 uh, percent in the United States right now. Chronic immune issues. People getting sick all the time. Memory. Uh, you know, how many times you like how many more times do I got to read this or I can't remember what I got to get done or I can't remember people's names or, you know, I'm struggling trying to grab this new concept I'm trying to learn. So memory problems are an issue. Hormone imbalances, big, big deal. Uh, low energy levels. You know, now we have, you know, five hour energy, you know, and it's all over the news. And you get to that four o'clock wall that they talk about and you're exhausted and you got to get through the rest of the day at work. And you're taking caffeine and massive amounts of other things to get your, your energy levels back up, which it shouldn't be that way. Uh, weight gain. A lot of people don't associate the fact that if, you know, and, and, and who out there might be like this, right? You are going to the gym extremely consistently, right? You're working out, you know, 45 minutes, hour, killing yourself in the gym every single day. Your diet is on point, right? You're eating really, really good. You're doing all the things you're supposed to be doing, and you just can't seem to lose the weight. Maybe it's an issue with your sleep. Maybe you're hoarding on, holding on the cortisol, and that's obviously going to make weight loss extremely challenging. Um, skin problems, you know, acne, skin conditions, eczema, like all these different types of skin conditions. Irritability, right? You're, you're with your spouse. You're with your partner. You're with your team at work, and you're just irritable, man. You're in a bad mood, uh, and that can be sleep deprivation. Low libido, you know, you don't, you, 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 you could care less about curling up with your partner next to you. You don't want to have sex ever. You have low libido, low sex drive. It could be a sleep issue. Inflammation. Obviously, as a chiropractor, I see this every single day in my practice, but people come in and they're just inflamed. Uh, you know, and inflammation is the root of all disease. So when you're talking cancer, diabetes, arthritis, um, um, 
degenerative disc disease, you know, any inflammatory condition, and they're, all conditions are inflammatory, low sleep can be an influencer of this. Constipation, right? We don't like to talk about that as much, but constipation, yeah, it can be sleep deprivation. Hunger cravings, you get those really big cravings at night, those hunger cravings, or randomly throughout the day of cravings for sugar or other types of like snacks and stuff like that. And it might not be, you know, like um, that you have p poor discipline or anything else like that, but this might be just a natural body's response to having poor sleep patterns. And vision, uh, you know, you wouldn't think, well, what's my vision have to do with good and a good night's sleep? But there's a lot of good research and studies out there that with people that have chronic uh, issues with their sleep have poor vision as a result of that. And that goes with vitamin A absorption and everything else uh, that helps with vision. So why, you know, why in the United States pr primarily is this a huge, huge issue as far as sleep is concerned? Uh, well, it's, it's our lifestyle. I mean, there is no doubt about that. So, when, you know, when we talk about the Evolve experience and what it's all about, it's all about understanding that in a modern society that's so rapidly evolving and changing, and you look at our body's ability to cope with those changes and evolve as quickly, it's just not going to happen, right? And so let's just talk about something as simple as the light bulb, right? Uh, I don't even know exactly when the light bulb was invented, but rest assured, once that light bulb was invented, life changed for us as far as our sleep patterns. You know, we're designed to be photosensitive. So when the sun rises in the morning, we're typically supposed to awake around that time. And then when the sun goes down at the end of the day, within a few hours or so, we're supposed to go to sleep. So say 12 hours, uh, maybe 14 hours is what we're supposed to be exposed to light for. Well, if you look at the modern society in the United States, between light bulbs, indoors, at our homes, TVs, computers, cell phones, all of which ex emit blue light and react with our body and change our hormones and biologies and rhythms, uh, we are exposed closer to 16 to 17 hours per day to light exposure. And that completely messes with our circadian rhythms, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Second of all, stress. We live in a, in a fast-paced, like, got to be doing things on time, always deadlines, always on the go, never time to sit down, smell the roses like they talk about. Uh, it's just a high-paced society. You know, and like one of the things I noticed, which was crazy, like, but when I went to uh, Europe this last year, and it, it never really appeared to me so obvious as, as simply as when I went to a restaurant in Europe and we would be sitting at the restaurant and we would order food and then it would be such a slow service pace. You know, they, they wouldn't even have come to our table to see if we wanted any water or beverages or food orders for like 10 minutes or so. Then they finally get to us. Then they take our order. It takes an inordinate amount of time in order to get our food. Then we get done with our food. And in America, what do we want to do when we get done with our food? We want the check and we want to get out the door, like right away. Not there. We get done with our food. Another 10, 15 minutes rolls by. It's just a much more relaxed you know, pace. Here, if you're not early at my office, you're late, right? Everything's run on metrics, on time. Get done one. Boom, it's lunch. Now we got an hour, two hours to take lunch. Boom, got to be back to work. Then we're working we get out of work as fast as we can. We rush home as fast as we can. Then we eat our dinners. And then it's fast, fast pace. That's, that's called the sympathetic dominant driven neurology that your body's in every single day. That is completely inhibitory to sleep. Sympathetic nervous system dominant during the day, active, awake, under stress, doing the things we got to do. Parasympathetic nervous system dominant uh, when we got to go to sleep, get a good night's sleep, good restful, deep restorative, recover sleep, and, you know, that's just not our dominant neurology based upon what 16 to 17 hours of light exposure and fast paced society every single day. So that's an issue. Another really hot, hot topic right now. Uh, you know, you talk about 5G um, and that's came out. Uh, we got cell phone towers, Wi-Fi routers. We're exposed to non-native EMF or electromagnetic frequencies every single day. A lot of research going into this, still a lot of controversy on does it affect us, does it not affect us, but one thing we know for sure is it actually can inhibit our bodies from producing melatonin. And melatonin is a, is a big, big deal when it comes to falling asleep and staying asleep at night. Uh, so we'll talk about how to mitigate that. And food, you know, food timing, alcohol consumption, stuff like that, 
if you're eating meals or snacks or consuming alcohol, like later in the evening, you know, two, three hours before you go to bed, there's no way you're getting a good night's sleep. Your heart rate's up, you're digesting food, and you're going to have restless uh, sleep. Your body temperature's elevated. All these things matter when it comes to getting good, deep, restorative sleep. So let's kind of get into sleep 101. We'll talk about sleep, the types of sleep, um, types of chronobiology that we're talking with sleep. And then that'll set the foundation of how we're going to mitigate all these things. All right. This short intermission is brought to you by Premier Wellness Centers. Uh, right now, during this epidemic, uh, we thought, how could we give back and how could we give people an opportunity in order to take a look at some of the things that we're actually discussing today in the podcast? And so we have a, a special that we're doing right now. Uh, so if you call uh, any of the offices or go to our website and actually put in your information, we'll contact you. But what it involves is this. You can come in for a comprehensive history, a chiropractic, orthopedic, physical, neurological evaluation. We do a test called heart rate variability that looks at your body's physiology and whether you're overly stressed or in a calm, relaxed state, which is better for immunity. Uh, we do this full entire workup. We take x-rays as is necessary to look at structure. And we have you come back on visit number two to review all of this information. Um, and based upon your health related goals and or weaknesses, we put together a customized program for you um, to address these weaknesses and help you move towards better immunity and better longevity and optimal health. Normal cost for all this is $264. And when you call in uh, for now and say that you want the, for a latter, lack of a better term, uh, Evolve Wellness Experience Special, uh, we're going to do that for only $19, which is absolutely crazy, right? <laughs> so normal cost $264 for you right now during this uh, pandemic, $19. A lot of our uh, other services too, we're doing at a reduced cost right now because people um, don't have that flow of funds coming in or are unsure uh, on future with monies. So hour long massages, normally $80, 50% off, $40 for an hour long massage. Talk about working on that lymphatic drainage for immunity, right? Um, adjustments, uh, if you're an existing patient, 20% off adjustments, regular $50, now $40. Um, acupuncture, uh, normally $100 for the workup, $75 for the analysis, which is an hour and a half session with the acupuncturist. Uh, we have all sorts of supplements. We have zinc, we have vitamin D, we have vitamin C. All the supplements you can't find, we have them at the office right now. So call the offices, 798700. Uh, visit us online. It's premierwellnesscenters.com. Enter your information, call the office, tell them the Evolve Wellness Experience, and we'll get you all of those things for a reduced price. So take advantage of that now. So there's two types of sleep uh, primarily, right? You got REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. It's, uh, it's very unique to mammals, actually. Uh, all other reptiles, insects, things like that don't have REM cycles. Uh, REM uh, basically is mostly when we're dreaming. Uh, it accounts for 20, up to 25% of our total sleep during the night. Uh, and then you have non-REM and that accounts for the other 75 to 80% of your, uh, sleep cycle. Now the non-REM there's stages. You got N1, N2, N3. N1 and N2 very simply are light sleep. N3 is going to be deep sleep. And when I talk deep sleep, deep sleep's like you're in a coma, like you're non-responsive, like somebody can like literally shake you almost and you cannot wake up. One of the ways when sometimes when your alarm goes off in the morning and you're in a state of deep sleep, that's like you sleep through your alarm. You, you don't even hear it, right? And so, or if somebody wakes you up, you are groggy and drowsy and disoriented and you don't know where you're really at at the time. Um, so that's deep sleep. So there's not really one more than important than another, uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, essentially, but you have sleep cycles through the night. So when you look at your total sleep, you want REM to be about 20 to 25 percent. You want deep sleep to be about 15 to 20 percent. And then you want your light sleep where you can be awakened very easily by a noise or a sound or somebody talking to you. That accounts for about 50 to 55 percent of your total sleep cycle. Um, 
in sleep cycles, when we talk about sleep cycles, what you don't know is that throughout the night, let's just say you're sleeping for eight hours, right? So during the night, you're going to spend part of those times in light sleep. Then you're going to go to deep sleep. Then you're going to go to REM sleep. Then you're going to go back down to light sleep, then to deep sleep, then to REM. So you go through these cycles. Every cycle usually lasts about 90 minutes. So in a seven to nine hour period in the night, you'd want to typically try to go through about four to five of these cycles. And then within those 90 minute cycles, again, 20% of it REM, another 15 to 20% of it deep, and then about you know 50%-ish is going to be uh, light sleep. Now, to understand all of these things and how it works, not everybody's identical, right? So although there are some people like, yeah, you know, I can get away with, uh, you know, five hours sleep in the night and I'm totally rested and good to go the next day. Long term, I promise you that is not going to be okay for them. They may do that, right? And so I learned a little something about myself when it comes to what's called chronobiology, meaning what, what, you know, you heard of the term night owls, for example, right? People that stay up late, you know, they like to stay up late, they function better at night, and then, you know, they sleep in a little bit later. Well, they're not actually night owls. There was a guy, Michael Bruce, B-R-E-U-S, if that's how you pronounce his name, but he's came up with what are called chronobiologies. So they are as follows. You have dolphins, you have lions, you have wolves, and you have bears, so those are the four different types of people. Dolphins are about 10% of the population. Lions, about 15 to 20% of the population. Bears are the majority of everybody. They account for 50 to 55% of the total population out there. And then wolves, they're about 15 to 20% of the population. It's interesting as I researched all this stuff is I found out that uh, how we came up with this is evolution. Uh, so hunters and gatherers, as we were back in, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, and we lived in packs, right, just like all the other animals out on the, on, on the plains in, uh, in the world. And so it made sense. So as we're going to sleep at night, everybody has a different watch. So a certain group goes to bed a little bit earlier, right? And then another part of the group is like standing guard, you know, waiting for a wolf or a lion or a bear or something to come up and they have to protect the tribe, right? And then as they start to go to bed, then another group wakes up at a different time and they're protecting the tribe. So everybody has these different biologies of when they were up or when they were sleeping during the day, during the night, protecting the tribe. And that's how our, um, our biology basically developed and evolved over time. So now, again... We have a certain lifestyle in the United States. We're up, supposed to be up at a certain time, supposed to be working at a certain time, supposed to be going to school at a certain time, and then going to bed at a certain time. That's our society. But it doesn't always match up with our DNA, which is quite interesting. So we, the reason our school starts at 9, and you know, or our work usually is a 9 to 5 schedule, is based upon the majority. It's the bears. Bears like to get up usually about 7, 7.30 in the morning, kind of get their day going. And then by 9, they're pretty alert. They're pretty productive. They're pretty ready to produce. They produce really well all throughout the day until 5, and then they go home, and then they can be social and have dinner, and then they usually get to bed, you know, maybe 10, to 10, 10 30, 11 o'clock at night, and they repeat over and over and over. Now, you talk about a wolf, which is more of I like to wake up at like 8, 30, 9 o'clock in the morning, right? Because like seven, definitely too early. Forget getting up at six. If I'm, I can't go to the gym at 6 a.m. There's no way I can do a workout that early if I'm a wolf, right? But then as the day goes on and time progresses, it gets to be six, seven o'clock at night and they're fired up. I mean, they're ready to go start working. They're creative. They want to go work out at night. And that, that's their prime time. And come midnight, they're still like having a tough time going to bed at midnight because it's just the way their bodies are made. So if you have a lion, and a lion likes to get up at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, right? So they, they wake up at 4 or 5, they crush the gym, they're creative first thing in the morning. But you get to be 5 o'clock at night with a lion, don't even waste your time trying to do something productive or work out or be creative. They're about to go to bed by that time. They like to get to bed like 9, 9.30 at night, and then they go right back to their morning routine. So the best way that you can actually find out about this, I found out, is if you go to Michael Bruce's website, which is called thepowerofthewhenquiz.com. It's free. 
You just click on that, and then you go through a different series of questions to see what your preferences are. Um, and it's not even 100%. I found out all about like just sleep and like when you prefer to get up and when you prefer to work out. It, it asks you some other questions about your personality and, uh, you know, are you an analytical thinker? Are you a creative thinker? Uh, when, you know, when do you prefer? If you're going to do a super heavy workout, like what would be the ideal time to do that? Uh, one other question was like, if you were going to go over and help a friend move, would you want to do that first thing in the morning from 8 to 10 or more in the midday or later in the afternoon? So it's just a series of all these different questions. And then based upon all of that, it kind of tells you what category you're in. And I think that's important because then if you know that's the case and then you know like how to set things up, it'll give you a better chance of like dialing in when the most appropriate times to wake up and go to bed are going to be for you. Um and, there, and believe me, there's a lot more factors that go into that. You know, how active are you during the day? Well, how old are you right now? So the National Sleep Foundation, for example, as I looked up like requirements of sleep by age, uh, interesting, I'll get, there's a lot of different categories, but I'll give you three. Newborns, brand new babies, zero to three months, they sleep 14 to 17 hours a day, right? They're like brand new, out of the womb, growing and developing like crazy, right? Fast forward to be a teenager, because I always wondered, like, why now I'll wake up earlier. But I remember, like, when I was a teenager in, like, middle school, high school, like, if my mom and dad wanted me to get out of bed before noon on a Saturday, I was, like, exhausted, right? It was just didn't make sense to me. But teenagers, uh, they require up to 10 hours a day. In fact, from 6 to 13, you require 9 to 11 hours of sleep a day. Because again, you're still growing and developing. Now you get up to like the target age you're probably most of you are listening out there today. You know, you're ranging between maybe 26, like up to even 64 years old, which is adults, seven to nine hours. And then as you get older than that, 65 and up, it drops just an hour. You know, a lot of people think, oh, like, you know, older people, like my grandma, you know, I used to think, oh, you got up at 4 a.m. and you went to bed at midnight, you need four hours. Well, it's not good. It's probably just they're less active than the average people, but Seven to nine hours is a sweet spot that everybody's listening on this today should be definitely striving for. Uh, but again, if you're like a super high end athlete, you're crushing it in the gym like an hour, like every single day, crossfitting, a triathlete, marathon runners, professional athletes, your requirements go up 10 to 12 hours a day for high end professional athletes is what you require. But again, the key is this. That's 10 to 12 hours in a 24 hour period. So it's not to say that you have to sleep from like 10 in the uh, 10 in the evening all the way till like 10 o'clock in the morning the next day. If you're a pro, that's not going to function. You're not going to be able to practice or do your sports, right? But taking naps, doing other things, and getting in some of these little uh, tricks that we're going to talk about can help you accomplish those things, of course. So the nitty gritty. Let's get into it. All right. Ways to get better sleep. Number one, you first of all, you don't know if you have a sleep problem and you don't know if what you're doing to improve the sleep problem is working based upon you thinking, I fell asleep last night at nine and I woke up this morning at seven. I must have got a good night's sleep. That, that doesn't cut it. You have to have something to be able to track. Now, when, if you're asking me my professional opinion, I have an aura ring that I, that I have on my finger, and this is one of the most effective ways I think there is to track sleep patterns. It's what made me become aware of my sleep deficiencies and put me on this journey right now through this podcast and in my personal life over the last few months to try to see, like, why was it I'm so restless at night and waking up? Even though I don't remember waking up, why am I waking up sometimes two to two and a half hours every single night I'm sleeping? Um, you know, and, and where's my weakness? Where's my deficiency? So you have to have something to track this stuff, everybody. Uh, so an aura ring, I think, is the best way. Like we talk about non-native EMF, like a Fitbit is constant non-native EMF exposure. So if you're sleeping with that on your wrist at night to track your sleep, it actually might be inhibiting your sleep. So you just got to make sure that whatever you're going to use is not something that's inhibitory to your sleep actually as well. So that's number one. You got to figure out something to track your sleep and see where your weaknesses are. Number two, you have to definitely look at sleep differently. Most individuals, and I, I told this to my assistant, yes, uh, my assistant yesterday, and he was like, holy cow, like that, 
I've never thought about it this way. Most people look at sleep as something you do at the end of your day. What I want everybody to do is completely flip it on its head right now. I want you to think about sleep as the beginning of your day, right? So if you lay like sleep is the foundation of my day, and so long as my sleep is on point and really, really good, then everything that I'm going to build on top of that foundation is going to be so much better. So let's look at it as the beginning of the day and not the end of your day. The environment you sleep in is so vitally important. So if you're sleeping in an apartment, uh, right, and your next door neighbor is like rocking out to like super loud music and Metallica late at night and all this stuff, um, you know, probably not a good environment. So the environment in your room that you're sleeping in, it needs to be like your sanctuary, like, right? It's like almost like your Zen den. So it needs to be calm, needs to be quiet, needs to be uh, dark. I mean, so dark, like you can't even see your hand in front of your face dark. Um, so that's, that's important. So one thing we found out is like, even like simple little things, since we're photosensitive, like if you have your cell phone on a stock at night and you're charging it, and then all of a sudden, middle of the night, all of a sudden you get alert, boom, blue light exposure to your entire room. You don't know that, but your body senses it, and it might make you toss or turn and be restless. Uh, what's another one we found out? Consistently at like four in the morning, and I don't know why the hell my community has this, but the sprinklers go on right outside my bedroom window. So all of a sudden it's like, it's like, you know, wakes me up and then I'm awake for 10 minutes and then I fall back asleep, but that's a disturbance in my sleep. Um, your, your LED little clock that's in your room that constantly has LED flashing in your, or in your face all night long, you know, for nine hours a night, it affects your sleep. Uh, the temperature of your room, right? Uh, whether you have a fan on, you don't have a fan on, um, the smell. I mean, there's like a million different things that you have to take into account, but the room that you sleep in is just absolutely vital. So uh, when we talk about cell phones, turn it on airplane mode, right? Make sure non-native EMF is completely turned off in your home. So Wi-Fi router goes down at night, airplane mode on your phone at night. Um, making sure you unplug any LEDs or you can use... Um, Blue light blocking like film and stuff like that to put over LED lights to block out the blue light. That's a, like a happy medium uh, to blue light exposure. Uh, turning down the thermostat to about 65 degrees. I mean, I know that sounds freezing, but when you're under your covers, it's not that cold. And then you can turn it back up when you get up in the morning. Uh, we'll talk about a way around that, actually. Uh, when we talk about the 16 to 17 hours of light exposure a day, the way we get around that, because like I don't expect anybody to go home at night and like sit in the dark with a candle burning and read a book. Um, I definitely wouldn't do that. But you can get like blue light blocking glasses, which filter out the blue light from a monitor or from the lights in your home to the TV, to the computer, to your cell phones. Even iPhone, I know, I just literally discovered this as I was going through all this research, is uh, they have a, um, a setting like after seven o'clock at night. Like the screen on your phone like goes a little bit more opaque or kind of tan in color, I, I notice it, or yellowish. And that is blocking out and filtering out blue light exposure. So even, um, even the iPhones are sensitive to this subject. Uh, don't eat a large meal. This is another issue for me. Uh, I work until 7 to 7.30 at night on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So by the time I get out of the office and I get home at night, um, after I'm done taking care of people for the day, I have a meal like at 8, 8.30 at night, and then I'm trying to go to bed by 10, 10.30, and it just, I notice when I track it on my aura ring that my heart rate is just elevated for about two hours or so after I go to sleep, and that's just not restorative and, and good recovery, and, and my aura ring tells me about it like every single morning, like your heart rate didn't go down till late last night, you're not recovered, and so, you know, that's, that's an issue. Trying to figure out a way to eat a lighter, smaller meal earlier, at least three to four hours before bed is important. Uh, another one. Core body temperature is extremely important for deep sleep. Tons of research that, sub that, that substantiates all of that stuff. So taking a really nice cold shower for five minutes right before you jump into bed could be a really good kickstart to getting into that deep sleep rhythm a much faster, actually. Uh, another thing is red light therapy. Uh, so we have red light therapy at our practice. And red light therapy has been shown to improve sleep habits as well. And that's just by sun exposure, vitamin D, 
uh, production, which is really important and uh, optimizing thyroid and hormone uh, levels in your body. So that's a good thing. New calm, total, total game changer for me. That's a, it's a binaural beat uh, software that you listen to for 20 minutes. What's cool about it is it's a couple different things. Number one, it's like a, it's like a, it's, Two-headed attack, essentially. Number one, it strengthens the neurology in your brain for parasympathetic dominance. So we spoke about we're in a sympathetic dominant world and we're constantly dominant, 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 and that inhibits sleep. So if you can actually do almost like exercises for your brain that are going to strengthen the part of your brain that helps you get into sleep quicker, faster, more efficiently, and stay asleep, that's an exercise everybody should do at least 20 minutes a day, three days a week, just like a workout. So think about a workout for your brain, and you're going to get better sleep from that. Second thing it's going to do is if you didn't get a good night's sleep, what I'll use this for is in 20 minutes, it simulates a 90-minute sleep cycle. So we said you want to get four to five of these sleep cycles a night. Well, let's imagine you got two, right? But remember, it's not about the seven to nine hours, it's about the 24 hour period. That's what really, really counts. So you can actually get in, say two back to back 20 minute cycles and simulate, um, what was that? Three hours of sleep essentially in 40 minutes and make up for the last sleep you didn't get night before. And then you're no worse off whatsoever from that four hour sleep cycle you went through the night for. So I'll use it on both ends of that. And we provide that at our centers and it's a, it's a game changer for me. Um, another thing we just found about, sometimes you can have ambient music and, or sounds in the background of your room. Now, again, it's not going to be like blaring out your boot, Bluetooth speakers and it's going to keep you up because it's so loud, but there's uh, apps called Sleepstream or another one I found called Brain.fm. And so you can like set it up to like how many hours you're going to sleep and then you play it out the speakers and it's like ambient uh, waves or wind or um, all these different like scenes and it actually will guide your brain through these different sleep cycles throughout the seven to nine hours a night. Super, super cool. Uh, PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic frequency. Uh, It's a really, really hot little thing that's coming around in different wellness practices. Not something that we do offer, uh, but you can get uh, different units for your home, like a Somni Resonance, a Flex Pulse, or a Body Balance mat. Um, really good for inflammation, really good for a uh, hormone regulation and production and, uh, lowers blood pressure and puts you into a really good deep sleep pattern, uh, in most instances, uh, something that maybe a lot of you use out there right now, uh, essential oils or aromatherapy. So if you get an essential oil diffuser, like right on your nightstand and you diffuse like low rose or lavender or something else that's really nice and calming in nature, uh, that can put your body in a state of relaxation and help you get to bed a little faster and more efficiently. Uh, you can turn your room into uh, what looks like a nightclub, but you do that by incandescent lights. So you have like little light red lights in your room, make it look like a nightclub, but you don't have the pounding music in your in your face. Um, but definitely that's something that's, uh, if you're going to go to, let's just say you're going to wake up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. Would you rather have a nice, calm, soft red light when you turn on the bathroom or go into your room? Or would you rather have something blaring in your eyes so you're like squinting and then you are awake and you can't go back to bed? So that's another little trick. Uh, We spoke earlier about dropping the room temperature down to 65. And for some people, that's like, well, I mean, I could do that, but then my kids are going to freeze to death and they're going to come jump in bed with me and then I'm not going to get sleep anyway. So the or you have a partner and maybe the partner that you like to sleep with, right, likes it hot in the bed and you want it cool in the bed. So a cool little thing we found um, from my girlfriend and myself is called an Uller mattress cover. This is unbelievable, like how people think of this stuff, right? Mattress cover goes on your bed, hooks up to lines. Uh, underneath your bed sits these two little machines and you fill them up with water and then it circulates up in through the mattress cooler. And then on your cell phone, literally there's an app that goes with this. And you can like literally set what time you wanna go to bed, what time you wanna wake up. And then you can set like, okay, when I jump in the bed, I don't want it to be freezing, right? So I get in bed and it's 80. Then as I go to sleep, every 30 minutes, I'm gonna drop at five degrees. And then when it gets to be like, midnight to 2 a.m. when you're supposed to be like getting really, really good, solid, deep sleep. I want that mattress at 55 degrees. 
And you would think, because I was like, geez, like 55 degrees, I'm going to freeze my ass off and I'm going to wake up, right? Absolutely not. Like definitely sleep patterns improved. So on as I started doing that. And then when you want to like wake up, you want your body temperature to slowly rise back up. So then once it gets down like a 2 a.m. to 55 and stays there for a couple hours, then little by little, right before I get up, it starts to go back up again and then goes back up to 80 degrees. And it actually helps my body start to wake up before my alarm even goes off in the morning. So that that has been one of the best things that I've bought for sure when it comes to like trying to help sleep out. Uh, sleep mask and earplugs. Um, I haven't really toyed around with that yet, but again, if you're sleeping in a, uh, urban city and it's really loud or you got a train going past your house at seven in the morning or something else, maybe you might need earplugs. Maybe you might need a, a mask over your face to block out all the other sources of light. Um, especially if like you have a partner that wants to read at night and you want to get to bed. Um, so that might be an, a, something that's obvious. Uh, another thing that I found was probably affecting was low blood sugar at night. So I, like a lot of other people, try to follow kind of a lower carbohydrate ketogenic diet uh, where my carbs are really minimized and stuff. But what I've found out through research is that if your blood sugars drop out or bottom out in the middle of the night, you'll wake up actually multiple times or not sleep sound. And I'm not suggesting that you go pound like a cake or like a bunch of food, like carb dense ice cream or stuff like that, because that has the opposite effect. It makes your blood sugar spike and also affects your sleep, but like slow absorbing, like good sugar sources. So like a fruit, like a blackberry would be an excellent source, good phytonutrients, good sugar content. Um, another thing I found um, in a book, um, which sounded pretty good, and I'm going to try this, giant spoonful of coconut oil, little dab of almond butter on top of that, sprinkle in a little bit of Celtic salt, and then squeeze out a little bit of raw organic uh, honey on top of that and just like mow that down. And it lowers blood pressure. It actually gives you mineral content and it gives you just a slow bleed of uh, carbohydrates throughout the night when you're sleeping and um, is a very, very effective technique. Another one uh, for you uh, vegetarians out there, right? So vegetarian, veget like, People ask me like proper diets and I always say like there's no like one diet that's like superior to the next really. But what you do have to recognize is like for a vegetarian, I mean, uh, longevity uh, show two th longevity studies on diet show two things. Number one, um, a vegetarian based diet is definitely superior. And number two, a lower calorie content diet is superior to a higher calorie content diet every single day. But that being said, if you're a vegetarian, right, and trying to follow that, that model, you do have to realize where the, deficiency are at, the deficiencies are at. So the deficiency with that would be protein intake, right? We're not getting a ton of protein. We're eating vegetables all day long. And there's other sources and way to make up for that. But 0.5 to 0.8 grams uh, of protein per pound of body weight is what you generally want to strive for as far as your diet is concerned. And the reason protein intake is important is because protein gets broken down into amino acids. And amino acids then fuel neurotransmitter activity. Neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, things like that. And those are all crucial when it comes to proper sleep regulation. Uh, another thing that gets broken down from Turkey, as we all know at Thanksgiving, is something called tryptophan. This is why you get done with that big meal and we immediately like rush over to watch football and lay on the couch and nap all afternoon. We also know that carbohydrate intake is important for that phenomenon to happen as well because we have the stuffing and we have the gravy and all the other things. So these are all just little things that protein consumption is definitely crucial if you're going to get good night's sleep. Supplements, uh, some of the tips, uh, melatonin, we all talk about melatonin and light exposure and decreased melatonin production. So, you know, 0.3 to 12 milligrams right before bed can be a good supplement to take for people that don't sleep so well. Magnesium, 500 milligrams a day. Uh, I personally take mag SRT. I started taking that. Uh, 
probably about two, three months ago. I noticed my muscles definitely are not as stiff and sore. So that was kind of an added benefit. And believe me, if like you have pain or discomfort or things, you're not going to get a good night's sleep either because your body just can't get in a state when it's like laying in one position and it starts to get pain because you're laying there. You're going to wake up and toss and turn and move around. So magnesium supplementation is, is good. So mag SRT from Jigsaw Health is what I take. Tryptophan, again, if you're not getting adequate consumption of protein, you can supplement with tryptophan. A milligram a day would be adequate. Zinc, zinc deficiencies are a big deal because uh, melatonin levels drop when we have deficiencies in zinc. Uh, and so you can get zinc from shellfish as a natural source uh, or take it from a supplemental standpoint. Uh, and another really good one, uh, there's a something called black, black ant extract. Uh, which is an extract you can take, and it has 10 times higher zinc content than shellfish, actually. So that's a little little tip on the extract you can take. Uh, we had mentioned before vitamin D deficiencies. Uh, vitamin D deficiencies are associated with poor health. Two things about vitamin D. If you don't get a lot of sun exposure, you probably don't have a lot of natural production of vitamin D, may need to supplement. I also found out recently that some people have a genetic abnormality that no matter how much sun they get, they can't produce vitamin D. So you would have to take a DNA test to know about that. But if you are deficient with vitamin D via blood work or genetic deficiencies or lack of sun exposure, 2,000 to 4,000 IUs a day. You also wanna supplement that with 100 to 250 micrograms of vitamin K. And a lot of supplements uh, come in combination. There'll be D3 plus vitamin K. Uh, but those are the types of values that you wanna do so your melatonin production is good. Uh, exercise on an empty stomach 20 minutes every single day before breakfast. Light, light exercise, 65% VO2 max. What that equates to is a brisk walk. If you're with somebody and you're doing a, a activity of exercise, should be able to have a ca casual conversation with them. Shouldn't be like breathing heavy and then trying to get your words in. So just light, easy, nice 20 minutes every single day pre-breakfast uh, in a fasted state. Um, if you're going to do a hard workout in the afternoon, like I, I do mine in the morning, uh, cause I just don't want, again, if I get home at seven 30 at night, go to the gym eight to nine, I mean, I'm definitely not getting sleep, but like a killer workout, like 75, 80% VO2 max breathing heavy, sweating like crazy, like all that. You want to do that between two to 6 PM. You get closer to bed. You too ramped up. You're in that, you're in that sympathetic dominant state from a hard, hard workout going to be hard for your heart rate and body temp and everything to calm down so you get a good deep sleep. Uh, grounding mats, I haven't played around with these too much, but grounding mats, um, you know, are, are good for electron transmission and relaxation of muscles and uh, brainwave activity and all that. Um, but yeah, Biomat uh, is one of the recommended ones, but I haven't done much research into that, but that seems to be has some good, good research behind it. Um, and like I said, you know, get naps, you know, I always wasn't a big like proponent of naps just because I just thought I was getting a good night's sleep. I wasn't super fatigued throughout the day and I would just power through. Um, but I used the Nucom device on my long days, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays for that 20 minute power nap. And man, I mean, my heart rate variability has never been better. I was always the sympathetic dominant stress dominant guy for sure. Um, between 50 to 60 hours of work a week and training in the gym, you know, five to 10 hours a week and running and golfing and trying to be active. And it just made my body in a stress state. So that's not good, but we just recently did it. And, uh, Newcom is, is the one thing along with sleep changes, exercise changes, and being in better balance that I've noticed made the biggest difference in my neurology for sure. Um, one final little thought, uh, would be if you want to like get really geeked out on all this stuff and go to a site that has like a lot of this information in it and like other things you can take little deeper dives into, uh, supermemo.com has tons of stuff on sleep and learning actually. So you can go to that website and check it out and probably spend hours and hours and hours kind of like going through all the different things that are in there. Super cool. So I, I guess the closing thoughts are this, you know, we went over, you know, why we have sleep problems in the United States here, right? It's kind of lifestyle and stress and the pace that we have to go at and everything else that we have demanded of and 
in the United States, which is good, uh, you know, in some levels, but obviously poor for our bodies on other levels. We talked about like the different types of sleep, the phases of sleep, and um, the, the quantities and the ty- and the hours that you want to get during the night, which is seven to nine. And then we went through like an absolute ton of stuff uh, on all the different things you can look. So again, this is a journey for me right now. And so the best advice I can absolutely give you is like, number one, like figure out something to track your sleep, right? So the Aura Ring is what I recommend, but whatever you choose to use is, is at least a starting point. And then depending on where your deficiency you're at, you're just going to have to like kind of toy and play with these things. So like for me personally, like I was like, man, I'm not sleeping at night. Is it is it because my body temperature is up? So I get the Uller pad, right? And now I'm cooling my body temperature and I notice that my deep sleep improved, but I still was restless, right? And so then I was like, man, maybe maybe it's just because I'm sympathetic dominant. I'm too stressed out, right? So then I'm doing all the new calm and the other stuff and balancing and reducing my uh, workout schedules and stuff like that. And my heart rate variability has never been better. So I'm like, all right, so that's fixed, but I'm still restless at night. You know, so then uh, one thing I actually didn't talk about today, I forgot. So then I was uh, listening to a podcast and I and they said, oh, uh, you know, CBD oil, because maybe, you know, that will, you know, take a you know, six milligrams, you know, six dropperfuls at night, and then kind of slowly titrate your levels up to see like, what's the sweet spot for you, you know, and I did that. And I just really didn't notice a significant change in the amount of time I was waking up at night. So the CBD wasn't the answer for me. And so then the cold shower helped a little bit more. And then, you know, so I'm, I'm still kind of working through this process myself, uh, I'm going to start supplementing with a little bit more melatonin, um, and such. Um, but I mean, all my vitamin D levels are good. My magnesium levels are good. My zinc levels are good. Um, so I'm still in the process and the journey myself, but, um, yeah, it's, everybody's so much different. So there isn't like a formula that's in there. It's like something that you're going to have to, uh, evaluate, measure, and then track progress as you plug and play with different types of combinations and things that are the right solution for you. So, um, I appreciate uh, everybody tuning in today for the next ep- or our latest episode of the Evolve Wellness Experience. And I'm super excited to come back to you on the next episode and share some more very interesting and informative uh, research and topics and guests uh, on this next one to uh, help you take your health and longevity to the next level. Thank you for joining. <laughs>